For many people, Janie Lane was the ultimate hair metal frontman. In an era full of pretty, leather-clad lead singers, he stood out, only to slowly decline as hair metal faded in popularity. This is the tragic real-life story of Warren's Janie Lane. Janie Lane's controversies started from the moment he was born in Akron, Ohio in 1964, when his parents named him John Kennedy Oswald. According to his 2011 self-penned autobiography page, his parents were huge John F. Kennedy fans and didn't realize the significance of having the same last name as Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. They soon realized their mistake and changed their son's name to John Patrick Oswald. He started playing drums at age 6 and claims to have started playing in clubs by age 11 using the stage name Mitch Dynamite. At 12, he got a guitar and started writing songs, which he would do for the rest of his life. For a 2011 interview with Scab Pickers magazine, he and some friends moved to Florida after high school and played in a cover band called Dorian Gray. In 1985, they made their way to Hollywood and started a glam punk band, Plain Jane with Janie as lead singer. Because he spelled Johnny as J-A-N-I, people assumed the man from Plain Jane was Janie Lane, and he stuck with it as a stage name. Plain Jane opened for bands like Guns N' Roses, but wasn't well received. Glam punk was out, glam metal was in, and bands like Poison and Warrants were getting all of the attention. Just as he was planning on moving back to Florida, he and drummer Steve Sweet were invited to join Warrant. According to his 2011 Scab Pickers interview, Janie Lane joined Warrant as a, quote, total sellout. He went on to tell the interviewer this, Plain Jane was not getting paid. We are not getting laid. We got to do something else. Warrant was already a popular Sunset Strip draw, but when it came to getting a record deal, the band had little success. And since bands like Poison were walking the MTV Video Music Awards red carpet in tuxedos, Warrant wanted to follow suit. In one of the more bizarre musical relationships of the 1980s, a manager introduced Warrant to Prince, who gave them $7,000 to record a demo for possible distribution via Prince's label, Paisley Park. According to Lane, Prince's response was uninterested in the songs, but gave the band his blessing to try and use the demos elsewhere. One of the demos, the song Game of War, ended up on the 1989 soundtrack album to the movie Bill & Ted's Excellent Adventure. But Warrant remained unsigned, and Lane considered moving back to Florida. Whoa! Months later, manager Tom Hullett, then known for his work with classic rock bands like the Moody Blues and Three Dog Night, went looking for a hair metal band to sign at the recommendation of Doc McGee. Famous for making stars out of Bon Jovi and Motley Crue, Hullett took McGee's advice and signed Warrant to CBS Columbia Records. Warrant released their first album, Dirty Rotten Filthy Stinking Rich, in January 1989. It was a hit, eventually peaking at number 10 on the Billboard Top 200 chart. It also went multi-platinum, selling 2 million copies, while the live long-form video featuring concert performances of the album's songs sold an additional 100,000 copies. It makes sense that they were so successful in both audio and video formats because their sound and look was very much indicative of late 80s hair metal which was extremely popular at the time. Warrant further encapsulated the spirit of hair metal by releasing not one, but two sentimental power ballads, Sometimes She Cries and Heaven. The latter, a fan favorite left over from Plain Jane and their highest ever charting hit, reaching number two on the Billboard charts. Of course, Warrant followed up Dirty Rotten Filthy Stinking Rich with an album whose title track was notoriously over the top and explicit. Cherry Pie was released on September 11, 1990, and was another hit, also peaking at number 10 on Billboard's Top 200, charting as the 21st biggest album of 1991, and going multi-platinum. Cherry Pie soon became Warren's signature song. The lyrics include a series of entendres that can scarcely be called double, while the video featured the misadventures of a grinning blonde woman who is periodically hosed down by the entire band via a comically oversized fire hose. In 2011, Janie Lane explained that the song was actually a last-minute addition to the album. The president of Columbia Records reportedly called him and said, Janie, you know I'm a big Aerosmith fan. Can you give me one more track, something kitschy and sexy like Love in an Elevator? In fact, Janie once went on record in an interview with VH1 claiming to, quote, hate cherry pie. 
Although he eventually recanted and professed love for the song on his 2011 autobiography page. The album's called Cherry Pie. The record's called Cherry Pie. I'm doing Cherry Pie Eating Contests. The single's Cherry Pie, right? Janie Lane's problems with women are another important factor when considering his wild early 90s warrant years. During the making of Dirty Rotten Filthy Stinking Rich, Janie walked in on his then-girlfriend in bed with his best friend. According to All Music, the event was so traumatizing that he had a quote, nervous breakdown and spent time recovering in a psychiatric hospital, which subsequently delayed the album's completion. Janie later used the experience to write the song I Saw Red, which went on to be another hit single from the Cherry Pie album, peaking at number 10 on the Billboard Top 200 in February 1991. Janie regularly discussed the autobiographical nature of the song. In a 2011 interview, he had this to say about the song. I Saw Red is a true story, and I still hate my ex-girlfriend. I'm sure she's doing wonderful now. Unsubstantiated rumors on fan and gossip boards claim that the girlfriend in question was allegedly singer Becca Bramlett, and the man with whom she was cheating was Bon Jovi's Richie Sambora. However, Janie and Becca remained friends throughout Janie's life. In a 2010 interview with Metal Sludge, Lane stated that he and Becca were still very good friends, which casts some doubt on these rumors. Even more notorious was Janie Lane's whirlwind courtship, marriage, and divorce of his first wife, Bobby Brown, who came into his life when she played the blonde bombshell in the infamous Cherry Pie video. In 2011, Bobby told Legendary Rock Interviews that Janie started pursuing her after they made the video together ignoring the fact that she was already dating Matthew Nelson of the band Nelson. He was interesting to me, but I had a boyfriend, oh. so I wasn't a cheater. But, you know, when we broke up, he asked me out and I said yes. In 2013, Bobby described to the New York Post how Janie flew her to Louisiana for a concert for their first date, finally making the match made in hairband heaven come true. Four months later, the couple was expecting a baby. They decided to marry in July 1991 and welcomed their daughter, Taylor, in early 1992. Unfortunately, the problem started soon after. Bobby told the New York Post, I loved Janie, but he drank a lot and he could be mean when he was drinking. When I found out he was cheating on me, I couldn't forgive that, and I left him. In August 1992, Warrant released their third album, Dog Eat Dog. The album was relatively successful, going gold by October by selling half a million copies but it was nowhere near the triumphs of their first two records. The only charting single on Dog Eat Dog was a cover of Queen's We Will Rock You, which peaked at number 83 on Billboard's Top 200. Much has been made about how grunge music killed off hair metal. Louder called out Alice in Chains' 1990 album Facelift as the first grunge album to hit big, and Janie Lane had his own Alice in Chains story that neatly summed up hair metal's dramatic eclipse. Encyclopedia.com quotes an interview with Lane from Musician Magazine, in which he recalls a marketing meeting with the president of Columbia Records for Cherry Pie. In the interview, Lane had this recollection. The first time I walked into the president of Columbia Records' office, and I remember seeing this gigantic poster of our album cover on the wall above the secretary's desk. I thought, wow, I guess we're going to get a push on this one. When he returned a year later to discuss promoting Dog Eat Dog, however, priorities had changed. This time, as Lane walked into Don Einer's office, who was then the president of Columbia Records, Lane recalled seeing a huge poster of Allison Chain's dirt over his secretary's desk. Upon seeing the poster in Einer's office, Lane knew that Warren's days were numbered, as the grunge era was about to sweep the nation. In 1993, Janie left Warrant for the first of many times to pursue a solo career, but he was back by the end of the year. Janie Lane and Warrant were still working from the mid-1990s to the early 2000s, but things were, quote, tough. According to his 2011 autobiographical page, dropped by Columbia, Warrant made four albums for independent label CMC between 1995 and 2001, none of which sold well or charted at all. In 1993, Janie started working on his Jabberwocky project, to which he periodically returned throughout the rest of his life. Janie married his second wife, actress Roanne Brewer, in 1995. They had a daughter, Madison, and were married until 2005. 
Although on his autobiographical page, Janey mentions the divorce in the same sentence in which he reports that he left Warrant in 2002 due to business differences. In 2003, he released a power pop solo album, Back Down to One, which was a huge commercial failure. Lane then entered rehab for alcohol abuse. 2004 was another hard year, and Janey spent much of it in the spotlight, working out his personal problems in front of an often unsympathetic audience. During that period, Lane appeared on VH1's Celebrity Fit Club, where he looked bloated and unhealthy from drinking. He also made a brief appearance on the Bad Boys of Metal tour, which he quit after just a few shows. As recounted in a piece by Spin, Lane quit the tour because he felt some audience members were only there to laugh at him. He even faced legal action from his former band when he attempted to start his own version of Warrant. Janie Lane's alcohol addiction continued to hurt him right up to the end of his life. He rejoined Warrant in 2008, but his lack of sobriety caused problems, and he was back out again in six months. 2009 brought an arrest for driving under the influence that led to a sentence of three years probation, and according to Spin, he was sentenced to 120 days in jail for another DUI in 2010. Nevertheless, there were some good moments during this time. Also in 2010, he joined fellow former hair metal superstars Great White on tour. In an interview with Louder, Great White's guitarist Mark Kendall had this to say about Lane. Janey was a complete professional. He was never late, and the fans were saying he hadn't looked or sounded so good in 20 years. He also announced on his autobiography page in 2011 that he had married his third wife, Kimberly Nash. The good times, however, didn't last. On August 11, 2011, Janie Lane was found dead of acute alcohol poisoning in a Woodland Hills, California comfort inn at just 47 years old. He had no identification, save for a note in his pocket that read, I am Janie Lane. His sister Vicky told Radar Online, Alcoholism is not something he chose. It's something he fought every day and it just won. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. 